have found super surprising about learning to free dive and hold my breath for a long time was just how light and slow the breathe up before the breath hold was. I guess having experienced a lot of these like Wim Hof style uh, breath trainings where you're extending your breath holds by over breathing by really taking in big gulps of air and really quickening your pace. Well, that, that's kind of what I was picturing when I was going into free diving and, and trying to figure out how to, how to maximize my breath hold. Um, but uh, the people at the school really were uh, encouraging the opposite. Uh, going into the breath hold was what they called relaxation breathing, which is really basically just normal breathing, but very light and very slow. Um, the rhythm was basically having like a one X breath in and then a two X breath out. So the time that you spend breathing in is half of the time that you spend breath breathing out. And this really helps to calm your nervous system and lower your heart rate. And heart rate is one of the most important things when it comes to breath holding, just because how far how fast your heart's going is determining uh how quickly you're going to be burning through oxygen how how ramped up your system is and how quickly you're moving through your your energy how tense your muscles are how quickly they're going to be going through energy and utilizing oxygen building up carbon carbon dioxide as a as a byproduct and thus you know triggering your urge to breathe so the lower you can have your heart rate, like if you think about uh, those iguanas who can hold their breath for a super long period of time, they're able to, you know, severely drop their heart rate. And that's what allows them to die forever and ever. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. And the breathe up is that key period where we're calming our nervous system down and getting that drop in heart rate. This has a lot to do with uh, the vagus nerve and how it controls um, our heart and our organs and basically this vagus nerve is kind of like our on and off switch for our heart and our organs and it it's basically controls you know the simplified version is that it controls whether we're in this fight or flight state the sympathetic or the rest and di digest state the parasympathetic um, interestingly, uh, this on and off actually happens on a micro level while we're breathing in. So an inhale or sorry, while we're breathing. So on an inhale, uh, we're actually, um, we're getting a sympathetic response from our system. The, the inhale produces this sympathetic response, which speeds up heart rate. And then the exhale is a parasympathetic response, response, which is the vagus comes on, it triggers this parasympathetic, and then the, the heart rate goes down. So by <clears throat> doing this relaxation breathing that they were teaching me and doing double the amount of exhales, we're increasing the time that we're in this parasympathetic mode and we're lowering heart rate. So this is a really actually a very scientific way of getting yourself to calm down and lower that heart rate right before you take your plunge. So, of course, to end this breathe up, you do take one to two really big breaths. So you are going to take in as much air as possible, both into your belly, into your stomach, into your chest and into your throat to try to just maximize that air. But it's important to not, uh, you know, like be doing this super exaggerated big gulps of air for two minutes to breathe yourself up because that's going to work you into a, a stressful um, state, which is going to boost your heart rate, make it super hard to um, hold your breath. And that's the other key component of uh, the relaxation breathing is just timing. So having these, um, really slow drawn out breaths is super important because 
uh, if we do these kind of quick sporadic breaths, um, we, we are also going to uh, put ourselves into a, a higher degree of a stress response more into this sympathetic state. You know, if you just think about any time you're sort of bracing for an impact or anything stressful happens, what does that feel like? <gasps> a quick inhale, a quick big inhale. So if you're doing that to prepare for a dive, if you're really <gasps> pumping <gasps> yourself up, like you're just going to be putting yourself into, you're triggering um, your physiology, which is interpreting that sort of breath as being associated with states of stress. So this vagus nerve, again, is providing this sort of switch for our physiology, moving us either into or out of states of stress and adjusting our physiology according to, to be best adapted for it. But to do this, the vagus nerve is actually 80% sensory and only 20%, um, about 20% motor according to Stephen Porges. And uh, basically what this means is that the vagus is constantly sensing envi our environment and, our, and the environmental cues we're getting to determine whether we're safe and can relax and be in this parasympathetic state or whether we're in a state of danger and we might need to fight or flight, uh, get into that sympathetic state or even if we need to get into this third state, which Porges identifies, the immobilization state. Basically being the, the uh, mouse playing dead in the jaws of the cat, that state. So basically what we're doing with the breath is we're kind of hacking in. Instead of waiting for environmental cues to tell us, to tell our physiology what state to be in, we're going to go in with the breath and, and go into this sort of feedback loop and use the rhythm of our breathing to tell our physiology that we are in a state of calm, relaxation, that everything is safe and okay. And that's going to get us the physiology we need, this parasympathetic state, which is going to lower that heart rate, make it super easy to hold our breath. So that being said, I think it's super important to point out that there are other ways to extend your breath hold. Um, like if you do the Wim Hof training uh, and you do this sort of method of over breathing, you actually will be able to extend your breath hold for a long, long time. I, I've gotten some of my biggest breath holds doing Wim style and other sorts of basically hyperventilation styles of breath holding. You know, you can add minutes onto your breath hold, but these strategies are not good for diving or anything to do with swimming or water. Why? Because it's actually carbon dioxide buildup that will give you the urge to breathe again, not oxygen deprivation. So the problem with something like Wim Hof and diving is that you're going to be blowing off so much carbon dioxide and you know building up quite a lot of oxygen there's some debate whether you can actually saturate yourself further with oxygen but you're going to have a lot of oxygen in your body and not much co2 so when you're doing these breath holds you're going to have a super delayed urge to breathe because you're building up carbon dioxide but you're starting from such a low level that you're not gonna get that intense urge to breathe. You're not gonna get this buildup of CO2 that's gonna trigger this urge to breathe until much, much later when your O2 levels have dropped quite a lot. So you can actually put yourself to the point of uh, blacking out, passing out, because you're never getting this urge to breathe until after the point where your oxygen has dropped so much that you've passed out. So you could be completely comfortable, do the super long breath hold and, and never get this feeling like you need air, but you won't have enough oxygen and you'll get your brain will trigger this response of needing to black out to conserve um, the last little bit of oxygen that you have, which obviously is not good if you're anywhere near water. So again, this any style of breath holding, breathe up where you're over breathing, 
hyperventilating is definitely a no-go when it comes to breath holding in water. So this relaxation style of breathe up will actually get us to the point where we're having the urge to breathe sooner just because we have we're starting at a point with more co2 in the body so we're going to get to that point sooner but we could actually think about that as being a useful signal because it's kind of giving us landmarks on where we're at in our hold and how much oxygen is in our body and how far off we are from blacking out so it's actually it's not a bad thing that we're getting these signals and then we can work to learn how to get comfortable with those dis those uncomfortable signals and to get more familiarity with what those signals actually mean and which ones need to be paid attention to immediately and which ones we can sort of, you know, override and keep on going. Mm -hmm.